I've been a personal trainer since 2006 and there are many, many ways to lose weight. One of them is the keto diet. I think the keto diet is highly overrated, but don't get me wrong. Solutions Plus YouTube channel. Here we're going to discuss is the keto diet safe for women over 50? There are lots of benefits to the keto diet. A drop in calories, a potential improvement in hormones, a drop in blood sugar if it was high to begin with, or more energy levels, and so on. But is it without risks or is it just fine? That's what we'll discuss in this video plus everything you need to know to execute the keto diet properly as a woman over 50. We're going to discuss health considerations, how to do it properly, how to deal with challenges like motivation, cravings, and more. And lastly, at the end of the video, I'm going to give you my own personal opinion on the keto diet. Before we jump in, who am I? My name is Igor. I'm the founder and CEO of a online personal training company called Fitness Solutions Plus. I've been a personal trainer since 2006 and I've published 11 books on exercise and nutrition, including three Amazon bestsellers on osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, and high blood pressure. So let's jump in. First, let's discuss some health considerations for women over 50. One common concern for women over 50 is metabolism. Does metabolism slow down after you turn 50? Well, the answer is, Kind of. <laughs> it slows down after you hit menopause. The average age of menopause is about 51 or 52. So it's not aging per se, it's the drop in estrogen levels. And then the question really is really needs to be asked, how big is the drop in metabolism? It's approximately 0.6% per year uh, after menopause. Another thing we need to consider is the hormonal changes that women experience after 50. The big one, of course, is menopause, which along with it brings a sharp drop in estrogen and progesterone. The way you execute the keto diet may have an influence on either raising or lowering your estrogen and progesterone levels. Another thing that needs to be considered is nutrient intake on the keto diet. Whenever you're starting to restrict any kind of macronutrient or food group, any food group contains a, uh, not just the calories, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, not just the macronutrients, it also contains micronutrients. So it will restrict things like uh, folic acid, it will restrict things like uh, the, the things like fiber and other things that you need for optimal functioning. That doesn't mean you can't do the keto diet, it just means you need to be more careful with planning how you do the keto diet. One common concern that's not really founded is kidney health. On the keto diet, it is a higher protein diet than a traditional diet or what people traditionally eat. So people often think that high protein damages the kidneys. That is not true at all. High protein only damages the kidneys of people with already damaged kidneys. It's like saying that jogging is bad for you if you have a broken shin. Well, of course, jogging is bad for you if you have a broken shin, but jogging didn't cause the broken shin. Likewise, a higher protein intake won't damage healthy kidneys. A higher protein may damage pre-existing damaged kidneys. That's another consideration. And finally, sustainability. I'm sure you've probably done many diets in your life. So with drops in, uh, drops in calories and rises in calories, that could be a challenge uh, on any kind of restrictive diet, whether that's the keto diet, Mediterranean, or any other kind of diet. There has to be behavioral support to make sure you sustainably do the keto diet, if that's the diet that you choose is right for you. With that out of the way, let's first discuss what is the keto diet. The full name of the keto diet is the ketogenic diet. That means it generates ketones. And what are ketones? Ketones are an alternate fuel source. So it is a ketone producing diet. Um, now, what do I mean by an alternate fuel source? Well, our bodies can really survive on two fuel sources, sugar or fat. Sugar goes by different names, glucose, glycogen, and of course sugar and, and fat. So the theory goes that if we remove one fuel source, if we remove sugar, we're only left with one fuel source to burn, that's fat. So that's the most common appeal of a keto diet. But how do you know you're in the keto diet? Well, you enter a state called ketosis. And there are different ways of measuring ketosis, including blood, uh, breath, and urine. The most accurate way is blood. To give you some references, 
the blood ketone levels of somebody on a normal diet, not on a keto diet, is less than 0.1 millimoles per liter. The, the ketone levels of somebody uh, who is on a keto diet is over 0.2 millimoles per liter. And so you don't really know if you're on a ketogenic diet until you actually get measured. Maybe you're eating foods that you think are keto, but if you're not measuring, you're not really sure. Now, what does that look like from a diet composition? A regular mixed diet might be somewhere between 40 and 65% carbohydrates, between 15 and 30% protein, and the remainder will be fat. On a keto diet, it's about 60% fat, very low carbohydrates, typically 50 grams per day or lower, and the remainder is protein, which is different than most other low carbohydrate diets. Most other low carbohydrate diets are low carb, high protein. The keto diet is low carb, moderate protein. So it's not as high in protein as a regular uh, low carb diet and therefore um, ketone levels on a low carb diet that's not ketogenic will be uh, will, will be lower okay um, so that is th these are the basics of the keto diet now let's chat about the, the how it applies to women over 50. how does the keto diet affect specifically women over 50? 50. There are a few different potential ways in which it could affect uh, hormone levels and other factors in women over 50. One potential way that it could affect it is estrogen. Estrogen is largely made of fat. There is a mother molecule and that's cholesterol. Cholesterol is a fat molecule. During menopause, estrogen levels sharply drop. So it's conceivable that a high fat diet will also increase estrogen levels, which may negate menopausal symptoms. Things like hot flashes, poor sleep quality, vaginal dryness, and others. On the other hand, it could also uh, conceivably cause issues because of a low carbohydrate, uh, it, it is a low carbohydrate diet, therefore it could cause some hypoglycemia or low blood sugar symptoms. Things like irritability, anger, and well, getting hangry, hungry and angry at the same time. So on the one hand, it may improve certain symptoms, but it might worsen other symptoms. So if you're more, pro more prone to estrogen-based symptoms, it might actually help that. But if you're more prone to blood sugar or insulin-based symptoms, it might worsen that. So it's really on a woman-by-woman -woman basis to figure out what is gonna work for you. And the way you can figure it out is before you start the keto diet, for about two or three days, keep track of your symptoms. So things like hot flashes, brain fog, insomnia, night sweats, and so on, whatever uh, symptoms are relevant to you. Rate them on a zero to, uh, to three level on how bother bothersome they are, and also give them a frequency rating. So just do that before you start the keto diet. Do the keto diet for about well, one to two weeks and then do a re repeat that kind of measurement uh, system after that period of time. Then you'll have a pretty clear idea of how the, does the keto diet affect your symptoms specifically. In addition to that, if you want to adjust the keto diet to help you specifically with menopausal symptoms, you want to include foods that are high in phytoestrogens. What are phytoestrogens? They are plant estrogens. In other words, they have similar effects to human estrogen, but are much weaker. Um, but they do mitigate some of the symptoms of menopause. So what are some examples of phytoestrogen? Uh, one uh, category of phytoestrogens is soy. Now granted, a lot of women are uh, concerned with soy and breast cancer or um, estrogen-based cancers, endometrial, ovarian, etc. So you, sh you should speak to a healthcare professional to see, is it right for you? Other examples of, um, of phytoestrogens are things like flax seeds, peanuts, red wine, dark chocolate, and so on. So consider including some of these um, in your diet to help you with the menopausal symptoms. In addition, one common concern for menopausal and postmenopausal women is bone health. The single most important factor, single, single most important nutrient for bone health is not calcium, it's not vitamin D, it is in fact protein. You need an adequate level of protein to maintain your bone health. And what is adequate? Well, I discussed that extensively in several of my other uh, YouTube videos, which are linked in the description below. In addition to that, to keep you fuller longer, if you are trying to lose weight, it's good to include green leafy vegetables, fatty fish, and low carb veggies, things like peppers, carrots, and so on. Uh, this, this makes the basics, the, the backbone of a healthy keto diet. If you're doing the keto diet and you have no health problems, fine, give it a shot. However, if you have some pre-existing health problems, consider consulting with a dietitian or another healthcare professional to see how does the keto diet interact with the rest of your health. Again, as I mentioned earlier, one common concern is kidney health. So if you have healthy kidneys, you're fine. 
but if your kidneys aren't healthy, um, then the kidney, then the keto diet may not be for you because a higher protein intake than you're used to may damage uh, already damaged kidneys. One other thing I want to mention is hydration. Hydration is very important because a lot of people mistake the feeling of thirst for the feeling of hunger. So how do you know if you're adequately uh, if you're adequately hydrated? One very simple test for that is what I call the P test. That is, if your urine is just lightly yellow, you're good. You have the right level of hydration. If your urine is deeply yellow, yellow, you're dehydrated. If your urine is com completely clear, you're overhydrated. And that's how you can easily gauge your hydration status. Granted, the color of your urine may be affected by certain supplements or by certain medications, but in the absence of that, uh, you, can use, uh, you can use the color of your urine as a hydration marker. Or very simply, for the vast majority of people, their thirst signals are pretty good. If you're thirsty, drink. If you're not thirsty, don't bother. Simple as that. Next, let's talk about meal planning and preparation. Because if you're going to do this diet right, it takes some planning to make sure you don't fall off the bandwagon as might have happened with previous diets. Step one in meal planning is to calculate your macronutrients. So figure out what are your calories, what are your protein requirements, and what are your fats and carbs, and start there. The way you calculate your calorie requirements is you take your desired body weight in pounds, multiply that by 15, and add in any calories you spend on exercise. Those will be the calories that you want to eat. And then you factor in protein, which again I talk about in my, in my other videos, link in the description below, and you can find other keto uh, macronutrient cal calculators online, so just search for that. So that's step one, which is calculate your macros. Step two is to think about the ingredients that fit those macros. Write them down on a list, Step uh, three is to plan out your week. What meal will you eat and when? What are you having for breakfast? What are you having for lunch? What are you having for dinner? In case you're intermittent fast and you're skipping either breakfast or dinner, I have a little bit of an explanation on that later on in this video, so keep on watching. And step four, buy the ingredients. <laughs> uh, simple as that. And that's meal planning and preparation for the keto diet. Now, of course, Despite our best plans, challenges uh, sometimes come up. So let's address how to overcome challenges. Let's discuss five of the most common challenges. Challenge number one, in no particular order, is cravings. What if you're craving something? One way to avoid cravings is to, well, supplement with a multivitamin. Very often we're not craving uh, you know, chocolate for itself, maybe we're craving the magnesium in chocolate. Could be that we're deficient and chocolate happens to be a very rich source of magnesium. Maybe we're not craving potato chips, maybe we're craving sodium. So a good way to get all around your, your bases, especially if you're dropping your calories significantly, is to just take a multivitamin to cover your nutritional bases. That's one way to manage cravings and there are others. Another very giant uh, obstacle is emotional eating. Now, I'm not gonna turn this, uh, this video in and of itself into an emotional eating video. I'll make those in the future. But one strategy that I'll use with my clients to help them manage their emotional eating is that on a meal by meal basis, just before they sit down to eat, I ask them to rate their hunger and fullness on a minus 10 to a plus 10 scale. So minus 10 to zero means I'm hungry. Zero to plus 10 means I'm full. So imagine this, you're sitting down to eat and you're asking yourself, how, um, how hungry or full am I? If you give yourself a rating of plus three, that means you're not hungry then why are you eating? It's for reasons other than hunger. And if that's the case, write down what emotion you're feeling in that moment. Are you bored? Are you unfocused? Are you tired? Are you upset? Are you anxious? Are you excited? What's going on um, with your emotions? So this is a very, very simple strategy that my clients will often use to help them with emotional eating. It's very effective. It works for a lot of people. It doesn't work for everyone, but there are other strategies. Another common obstacle is social situations. What if you have a lot of business meetings, business lunches, business dinners? What if you just like to, uh, to go out to eat? What if you like to have people over? How can you manage that? The key here is preparation. If you like to go out to eat, it's very, very important to look at the menu online before you go there. This way, when you get there, usually if you haven't looked at the menu, you're going to order the tastiest thing. Unfortunately, the tastiest thing is rarely the healthiest thing. However, if you've made that decision 
before you've gotten to the restaurant of what to order, you're going to already be in the right state of mind. This way, when the waiter or waitress comes to give you the menu, you won't need it. You'll already know what to order. So that's one way to plan around social situations. What about other situations where you don't have a choice, where there's no menu? Well, there's many, many other strategies you can use for that, which I discuss in my other video called the top 20 cheat meal strategies, link in the description below. Another common um, obstacle is motivation. Very often when we start a new diet, we're excited by the potential, but the actual doing of the diet is a lot less exciting because you're probably giving up foods that you really like and so on. So how do you stay motivated on the keto diet? One way to do that is to keep track of your results. And we'll discuss what kind of results later on in this video, which we'll jump to in, in a second. And lastly, we're going to talk about overcoming plateaus. Inevitably, whenever you start a new diet, what happens is the weight will drop and drop and drop, and eventually it stops dropping. You're not where you want to be yet, but it stops dropping. How do you overcome that? The way you overcome that is either by adjusting your macronutrients, so having a higher protein intake or a lower fat or carb intake, or exercising more. By and large, the better choice for women over 50 is exercising more for reasons that I talk about in my, in my upcoming menopause book. Next, let's talk about exercise on the keto diet. Exercise is beneficial for a lot of things. I'm sure I probably don't have to tell you, but some of the benefits include stronger muscles, stronger bones to help you prevent osteopenia and osteoporosis, more endurance, more energy levels, tighter skin, and so on. So how should you exercise if you're a woman over 50? It's been commonly said that when it comes to weight loss, nutrition plays 80% of the role and then exercise plays 20% of the role. That's not the case for women over 50. For women over 50, exercise plays a much bigger role because your involuntary physical activity starts to drop. So to make up for the drops in metabolism, you can actually exercise more. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to do an hour seven days a week, but frequency trumps everything else. If you were to do 10 minutes seven days a week, it's far better than one hour once a week. So exercise is very, very important for reasons that, uh, for, the, for these reasons and reasons that I get into, into in, in many of my books, as well as other videos. Earlier, when it came to the section of overcoming obstacles, we talked about motivation as an obstacle. So how do you stay motivated on the keto diet? One way to stay motivated is to monitor your progress. What does progress mean? Well, progress may be the exact outcome that you're looking for. Maybe it's weight loss, maybe it's something else. And that's one form of progress. So measure your weight, but don't measure just your weight. Measure your waist circumference, measure how your clothes fit you. Um, but I also encourage you to have some some measurements that are outside of outcome, like process measurements. In other words, you can control your um, what you put in your mouth. What you can't control is your weight. Weight is controlled by, by many other things. Weight is controlled by water fluctuations, hormonal fluctuations, how salty is the food that you had earlier, and so on. You can influence your weight, but you can't control it. However, what you eat, how much, and when is strictly controlled by you. So one thing I would also measure as a gauge of progress is your compliance to the keto diet. And your goal is to make it a game. Try to beat your compliance from the previous week. So let's say you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. That's 21 meals per week. So if week one on the keto diet, you could only stick to it 14 out of 21 meals, week two, try to shoot for 15. So this is how you can stay uh, motivated even though you're not necessarily losing weight. The weight loss will come as a, as a long-term effect. But keep your eyes on the process and the outcome will come. Besides that, there are other measurements of progress. If you're exercising, there's also the measurement of strength, endurance, flexibility, and so on. So it's good to have a holistic, a balanced approach to what is progress. Now, lots of women want to do keto diet while intermittent fasting. That's certainly an option because intermittent fasting is not a nutritional choice, but a logistical one. I have an entire video on intermittent fasting for women over 50 linked in the description below. In conclusion, what did we learn about the keto diet for women over 50? First of all, we learned what is the keto diet. The keto diet is a ketogenic diet. In other words, it is a high fat, low carb, moderate protein diet. We also knew that it's very, very important to get enough protein for the sake of, well, your muscles as well as your bones. We also learned how to plan meals properly, which is to figure out your macronutrients, to figure out the ingredients, to figure out what you're gonna eat, and finally go shopping for those. 
Then we also talked about exercise and the benefits of it. Improved strength, improved endurance, improved flexibility, stronger bones, and all the things that you want as a woman or 50. We also talked about how to monitor progress. That is, yeah, you may want to use it for weight loss, but you also want to track your behaviors as well as areas outside of just the nutrition side of things like improvements in strength, endurance, flexibility, and so on. Now, what are my own personal views on the keto diet? I've been a personal trainer since 2006, and I've seen, I think there are many, many ways to lose weight. One of them is the keto diet. I think the keto diet is highly overrated, but don't get me wrong. Overrated does not mean useless. The word overrated means benefits are being attributed to it that are not correct, but that does not mean it doesn't have any benefits. Useless means it has no benefit. I don't believe that either. I believe the keto diet is beneficial. Who is it beneficial for? The people for whom it's going to work. Who is it going to work for? It's going to work for you if you actually like the taste of keto foods. If you enjoy eggs, bacon, avocados, olive oil, things like that, the keto diet is likely a very, very good choice for you and it's going to work for you well in the long term. The keto diet is not for you if you don't like those foods so your long-term adherence is bad. There are also certain contraindications to the keto diet. If you have familial hypercholesterolemia or hyperlipidemia, it's not for you. What that means is that you have a genetic condition where your cholesterol is high no matter how well you eat or your triglycerides are high no matter how well you eat. It's probably not also not for you if you suffer from gout. It's not for you if you've had your gallbladder removed for reasons that are inherent to the keto diet. Outside of those, most people are okay with a keto, with a keto diet as long as they run it by their health professional or a dietitian. So those are my views on the keto diet. I hope you liked this video. If you did, click like and subscribe. It'll help this video reach more people who need help with a keto diet and it'll help you be notified when I publish more content on the keto diet or exercise and nutrition for women over 50. Thank you and goodbye.